we have more from, from the trial. And when that scenario did not achieve the desired effect, he changed the story again to now say, I fired Nigel Wright because Nigel Wright betrayed and deceived me and isn't fit for office. So now ask yourself the question. He knew about the $90,000 check on May 14th. Why did he not feel a sense of moral outrage on the 14th and fire Nigel when he knew about the 90,000? The answer is because what he pretended to feel, he wasn't feeling at all. What he was doing was looking at his polling and seeing the story wasn't working and it was getting traction and he was getting to, he was losing credibility. So the words didn't mean anything. The truth of it didn't mean a thing. And there are some other examples. Um, if you take a look at Linda Keene, and this story hurts me a lot because I've gotten to know her uh, since she was fired in 2009 by the Harper government. The story that they put out was that Linda Keene was a liberal hack who shut down the nuclear reactor at Chalk River and put cancer patients at risk by cutting off the supply of isotopes that were produced at Chalk River. And at that time, Chalk River produced 60% of the world's isotopes. Here's the truth of what happened. Linda Keene never shut down the Chalk River reactor. The Chalk River reactor was closed down for routine maintenance when Linda Keene was in Mexico on holidays. Her staff called her and said, we notice that the licensee in this case is in violation of their license because they have only got one cooler on the nuclear reactor and the condition of the license was two. So there was no panic. Keene finished her vacation returned to Ottawa and simply said to ABCL, you're going to have to put that second cooler on the nuclear reactor as a term of your license that you're in breach of. That's what her, her problem was. Then Gary Lund, who is the Minister of Natural Resources and the Prime Minister's office, said start up the reactor without the second, without the second uh, cooler on, on the equipment. It's not needed. And then Stephen Harper, the nuclear physicist, said there will not be uh, there will not be an accident at Chalk River. And then he called Parliament into an emergency session, and he brought the president of the Canadian Medical Association in, and he said terrible things about Linda Keene, about being a liberal hack, about being incompetent and not a leader who couldn't serve. And then they ended up firing her. But you know, she actually told me she came to my apartment. Ottawa, and she said, I got a call from a deputy minister, a man who's now a very powerful player for Stephen Harper, and he said, sweetie, we're going to give you a chance to quit. And if you quit and admit you're wrong, uh, we won't do anything to you for six months and then we'll terminate you. Your choice is either do that or we'll fire you. And her answer was very ethical. She said, I made the decision I made under the statute I'm supposed to be enforcing and at the advice of my scientific staff who are impeccably credentialed people. And if I agreed to do this to save my neck, I would cut all my people that trust me loose and discredit them and make their advice look wrong and I won't do it. So they fired her. But it wasn't just enough to fire her over false allegations. She never closed that reactor down. She just didn't let the guy operate it in violation of his license which is what we would all expect. But they, she has never made a dime in Canada since. She has never worked. She won, in the same year they fired her, she won the Nuclear Woman of the Year in the world. It was given to her in Paris. She has not made 10 cents in Canada because Stephen Harper has blackballed her. But here's the best part that shows how much of a lie they told about Linda Keene. The Chalk River reactor was closed down for a total of 18 days in the Keene incident before she was fired. Eight months after Linda Keene was fired, Chalk River had a major heavy water spill and was closed for 18 months. Did Stephen Harper call back the House of Commons in an emergency session? Did he bring the president of the CMA in front of Parliament and say people would die? Did he say they had to start the reactor no matter what because people needed the isotopes? No. He said, it doesn't matter. Australia will pick up the slack. And by the way, we're getting out of the business anyway. So two diametrically opposed treatments of people, which show that 
in the first instance, Linda Keaton was the victim of a political witch hunt, as so many other people have been. I had uh, Richard Colvin, diplomat, come to come to my apartment. I saw a lot of fear in writing this book uh, from various people who were frightened to talk to me. And that's not uncommon in, in the business I'm in. People are nervous to talk to me. Um, a lot of fear in the prison book, a lot of fear in Justice Denied in the Mount Cashel book, people afraid of institutional blowback, and a lot of other things. But I didn't quite see fear like I saw in Richard Cove that day. He was our top um, embassy official in Afghanistan. He is the one who uh, found out from the Red Cross that we were likely delivering uh, detainees to torture at the hands of the Afghan National Army. When he came to my apartment, he sat across the table from me. And the way I'll work is I'll take my keyboard and I will talk to the person and copy their answer down and type it as they talk. So I started asking Richard questions, but he didn't answer any questions. He just sat there silently looking at me. And I said, Richard, are you all right? Is there something wrong? And he said, can I take the battery out of your cell phone? He was staring at my cell phone. And he said, because the battery on the cell phone can turn it into a transmitter, and I don't know if you work for CSIS or what you do, but they followed me here, and I'm very nervous to talk to you. So I handed him my cell phone and said, yes, you may take the battery out. No, I don't work for CSIS. And we had the discussion of what happened to him. Um, he was writing a book, but he was terrified to talk about it because he thought that he would be charged under the National uh, Secrecy Act. Um, so he was a person who took a chance to talk to me, but was frightened. There was another fellow, very famous artist in Canada, who did an interview, and then called back and said, you can't use it. And the reason you can't use it is I represent two charities in this country, and I have for 25 years, and if they see what I've said, they'll take their charitable status away from them. So he withdrew the interview. And that happened a few times in this book. Munir Sheikh, who was head of StatsCan at the time, came to the apartment, <coughs> sat down on the Chesterfield, didn't go near the kitchen table where I work, and started to cry. And he looked at me and he said, no, I didn't leave Pakistan because I had no money. I left Pakistan, we had lots of money. I left Pakistan because of the tyranny of the government, always on us, always watching us, always oppressing us. Mm -hmm. And now I found the same thing here. Now, when your shade went to the clerk of the Privy Council, when Tony Clement began lying about the alleged advice that Manir Sheikh had given the minister, in a nutshell, Tony Clement said the decision to get rid of the long form census was the advice of Manir Sheikh, the chief statistician, a total and utter lie. Manir Sheikh complained to Wayne Waters, who was the clerk of the Privy Council, and said, This man, is saying things that are that, that are going to actually cause a revolution within StatsCan because every statistician knows nobody would ever recommend getting rid of the long form census. It's just not sensible. So you've got to stop him from saying those things. So Shape called the minister, the minister said he wouldn't do it again, and a week later he did it again in Vancouver. So finally, Pinear Shake asked for an interview in the Prime Minister's office because he could not bear the fact that his minister was lying about him for political reasons. And Dimitri Soudas said to him, don't you get it? Our ticket to a majority government is getting rid of the long form census. And so, uh, uh, Manir Sheikh left the meeting. He said, I felt like a criminal. I went home to my wife and I said, I've worked all my life with an ideal job, the perfect job, and now this has happened to me. And she said, Manir, if you don't resign, I'll never respect you again. And that's why he quit. Another case where lying won out over truth telling is the case of Bill, Bill Casey, MP for Colchester in, in uh, Nova Scotia. A big conservative, a very popular man, a man of his word, a person everybody liked. And he was in on the, uh, the negotiations for the Atlantic Accord. And under the terms of the Atlantic Accord, um, he was satisfied that the the Atlantic provinces had gotten the best of both worlds. If were, things worked out under one scenario, they could go back to the old deal. If things were different, they could take the new deal. And Atlantic Canada would somehow end up 
a little further ahead, i.e., the money they made from their offshore oil and gas wouldn't be clawed back in taxes by Ottawa. And so the region could get some wealth, which it desperately needs. And so when Bill Casey saw the actual Atlantic Accord that was being voted on in, as part of the budget, he realized that the Harper government had changed the wording. He took the agreement, the amended agreement, to the Justice Department and got an opinion. Was this the deal that was negotiated? And the answer that came back from the lawyers was no, it isn't, it's been changed. He took those documents and those opinions to Stephen Harper personally and put, put them out on his desk and tried to make his case. Stephen Harper took his hand and swept the documents off the table and said, Bill, the words mean what I say they mean. And looked at me and said, your problem is you've never been with the program. So Casey decided he could not vote for the budget, and ironically, another wife came into the play. He came out of a room and he said, the bells were ringing, he had cast his vote, he was kicked out of the Conservative caucus and he voted against the budget, so he called his wife. And his wife said, Bill, it's simple. Is it the Atlantic Accord that you negotiated, or is it? And he said, it isn't. She said, don't vote for it. So what happened with Bill Casey? Kicked out of the caucus, ran as an independent one, and then he got started to get calls from the mayors of various uh, towns and cities in his riding, and they were saying, "Bill, get in your car, come down here. We have a real problem, and the problem is the federal government has cut our infrastructure grants." And when we phoned the PMO and asked what why they had done that, they said, "Ask your MP. You got the wrong MP." And that's the way, that's the way these guys um, operate. Uh, the last person I want to mention personally, I spent a lot of time with this woman, I traveled to Edmonton to meet her. She wasn't anxious to talk to me. She had a very rough go with Stephen Harper, and that is Helena Georges. Helena yeah. yeah. Georges has had her life ruined by Stephen Harper. And when it comes down to um, the story, it comes down to this. Stephen Harper personally instructed Ray Novak, who was his deputy chief of staff, to write a letter to the commissioner of the RCMP making outrageously defamatory accusations against both Elena Georges and her husband, Raheem Jaffer. One of those allegations was that she had snorted cocaine from the breast of a hooker in a club in Toronto. One of the allegations was that she and Raheem were involved in offshoring money, hiding it in the Caribbean. Others said that the couple was involved in prostitution in Toronto. And without a shred of evidence and zero effort to corroborate the source of this information, Stephen Harper persuaded the commissioner of the RCMP to launch a three-month full court press investigation with seven officers into every single aspect of uh, Helena George's and Raheem Jaffer's life. At the end of that investigation, Every single allegation was proven to be false, and the commissioner of the RCMP wrote a letter to the prime minister saying, not a word of it is true. And here's the killer part. Stephen Harper decides he's going to kick her out of the caucus even though she's been exonerated. And the reasoning that he gives is almost as strange as the messenger he used to deliver the reason. He said that Elena Georges did not rise to the high standard of the Conservative Caucus, so that's why she was being kicked out. And guess who delivered the message? Dean Del Mastro. <laughs> that paragon of virtue, shackle man, as we call him now. So those are the real people, the faces I talked about, the stories that, that move me, because those people's lives have been destroyed by this man. And he uses the full force of government uh, to do those things. Now, if I were to ask everybody in this room tonight how important Medicare is to you, I think I'd get a pretty solid answer that it's one of the foundational things of our country, right? So Stephen Harper once ran the National Citizens Coalition. The National Citizens Coalition was run and created by a private um, drug a salesman from London, Ontario, who was dedicated to the destruction of Medicare. He wanted all of it to be private. 
And that's why he set up the NCC, which Steve 